So good evening, everyone, everyone in the room and everyone online. So it is a great uh, honor, a great pleasure to um, come to Leeds University to give the lecture organized by the Leeds University Confucius, Confucius uh, Institute. Um, so it's wonderful to come back to Leeds again. Uh, I have been here before. Um, this is a great university and uh, uh, in my area that I know as an expert, you know, it has a, a world-class business school and also like in my specific area in uh, um, international business, uh, which Jiao's also, you know, studied uh, and doing research on. Um, here, Leeds University has a group of world leading experts in the area. And I have a long-term colleague, friend, and co-author, Peter Buckley, who was also the first uh, director of the Confucius Institute uh, at Leeds uh, University. Um, so he is, for me, is somebody I look up to, um, who really, as a role model, but also intellectually gives me a lot of advice uh, and guidance. Um, so, yeah, it's wonderful to come here to uh, share with you my, my thoughts on China in 2030 and its role in the world economy. As, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think I, I have muted. Uh, <laughs> I'm a one. Who now doing research on technology and, uh, and the innovation, and now you know, <laughs> realize technology is, has some tricks. We need to get it right. Now, as Zhao said, this is a high time, and it's a, a special time, you know, that this topic will attract a lot of attention. But this is also a topic we need, um, you know insights but also some some courage uh, to really uh, share the thoughts uh, openly uh, in the public um, because of the current uh, um, environment but anyway this is a very important topic the country china will be there and it's currently the second largest economy in the world we cannot avoid it this is an important topic um, you know, that will accompany us in the, the future several decades at least. So, yeah, I think um, at this important point, it's good for us to share our thoughts, discuss about this, or debate on this, and then get maybe some pictures clearer or get some kind of misunderstanding clarified. So, I, I will, so today I will. Um, like there is a Chinese old saying is that you 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 how dry in you you throw some bricks out and try to attract some more jade comes out. So what my my talk will be the the bricks you know uh, throw out. But I believe there are a lot of the jade kind of comments um, come from the audience and all, uh, online and in the room. So why China is important? Now this country is the second largest economy and the largest exporter and the manufacturer in the world. So the country opened up its economy and started reforms in 1978. So since then, we see the country has went through exponential growth, exponential growth, and uh, registered uh, on average 9% annual GDP growth at a speed of uh, 9% over the past 40 years, which is really amazing, amazing. And uh, the outcome, in addition to lift the country to a, one of the largest economy in the world, but also I think more important is it helped 800 million people escape poverty. I think that's more meaningful for me, really help people avoid, escape hunger, poverty, and have jobs and have income, and their kids have education and healthcare services. 
And uh, over these uh, four decades, China also have seen you know, registered exponential growth in its trade following its opening up to the world. So China is now the, the world's largest exporter and the world's largest trading country in, in the world in the world. And then this diagram shows that China actually China's exports uh, you know uh, exceeds the second largest country nearly you know doubled the size of uh, the exports from the uh, second largest country second largest country. While all these you know are impressive uh, achievements in recent years, since the pandemic, especially since 2022, we see China's economic growth, we see very big volatility in its GDP growth since 2020, the spring, when the pandemic uh, broke out. Although during the pandemic, there were times that China did very well, but since 2022 is last year, the country really being hit by the pandemic. Not only the country, the economy is really, I think the society being hit by the pandemic. So the latest issue of the economist is asking whether China, you know, has come to its peak, whether the growth is going to flat and then even going down. So this is the question. And uh, so in, 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 in today's lecture, I'm going to you know, analyze whether the Chinese economy has come to its peak and it will never become the largest economy in the country. Would that be true? So let's, let's look at. Does the concern that you know, raised by the economist journal has some kind of foundation? has some reason underlying it. So yes, I think there are some challenges and really serious, significant challenges that face the Chinese economy. The first is the recovering from the pandemic. As I said, the pandemic hit the Chinese economy and the society really badly in 2022, last year. And that has hit people's confidence, changed people's behavior, and also even psychologically what people were thinking and people's ambition towards growth or towards you know, growing business. And also the, the private sector also being in heat. In addition to the uh, pandemic, but also some of the stringent uh, uh, um, uh, regulations and also oh, some of the, the, um, the tough policies um, towards the internet uh, um, sector in China. So the recovering from the pandemic, like nowadays people say there are some strange things in China. People don't go, go out for shopping and then they go out for, for tourism. You know, that, that reflects what I think it's a reflection of people's mind, what they put first, what they put first. And that there are other changes uh, 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 in China uh, uh, since last year. And in addition to this, there are another uh, four areas. One is the system reforms and how to restore the confidence of the private sector. And uh, China started the systems reforms in 1978. It started from you know, reforms of the, 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 the state-owned sector, the agriculture sector first, then state-owned sector, the price system, opening up to trade, uh, and then later foreign direct investment, et cetera. And now there are still reforms to do, but these are the very difficult reforms, system reforms. People say it's a deep water area, deep water area, very hard things because there are existing kind of stakeholders who benefit from the existing in the sector. There are resistance, uh, resistance to the reforms. And also economic rebalancing. Still China need to do the rebalancing. Rebalancing is not a new word. 
rebalancing has been, you know, people talked about rebalancing for at least 10 years. Uh, originally, it's China has been as export driven, trade driven economic growth, one of the drivers. So um, my PhD is about export led growth. That's the East Asian model from Korea, uh, from Japan, then from the, the, the little uh, tigers like Malaysia, Indonesia, all kind of Washington consensus kind of you know, uh, type of export led growth. And now, because China become very dominant in the grow in the in the world uh, uh, export market, now there is a need about rebalancing, uh, relate to this globalization in, uh, and uh, integration. And there is a, a very strong suggestion about China need to uh, stimulate the consumption and the domestic demand, so that domestic demand and the, and the, and the export you know, uh, get a balance, get a balance. However, it, it has not been easy because boost consumption is not to say, governments tells everybody you, we need to spend more. It has not been, you know, seen much changes, why? Because behind boosting consumption, there are a lot of other factors like social security, about you know the reforms of the public health um, health system, education system, which you know make people do not worry, don't need to save money for their healthcare, don't need to save money for their uh, edu kids' education, etc. And also this income inequality, economic growth, but fall accompanied by high level of income inequality. So the majority of people still don't have too much to. to it has not been easy, but nowadays it's moving. I think it's moving because of the trade war, because of the sanctions pushed the Chinese to do this dual circulation. This dual circulation, one circulation is a domestic circulation. I think that will do some good for the, uh, for the rebalancing, push the rebalancing. And the, the number four is the environment ch challenge. So this is a, a global, global challenge climate change, and for China in particular, not only the, 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 the air quality, quality of the air, but also because of the country. When I was young, this, we, we say China is a country with a lot of resources, it's a resource rich country. When I was young, so yeah, uh, I, um, I'm already you know, with all the gray hair, but nowadays China is a major import, importer in the world of natural resources and the commodity and the commodities. And with such a large population, there are energy, you know, security, water security. People have not paid enough atten attention to this, but actually this water security is also a very big problem for China and also other kind of climate change, uh, uh, air pollution, etc. There are other. so this kind of uh, environmental sustainability to, you know, has for some time really become a hard constraint for China's high, high rate growth. So to solve this, we see China is making, you know, one of the country, I think is one of the country makes the greatest efforts in pushing, pushing the uh, uh, green transformation. And uh, also the final challenge is the geopolitical tension and the China's integration to the world, as Joe said. Now we are in the UK and we can see, you know, maybe feel more truly and, and deeply than people inside China about this, the level of your political tension and the trade war and how that affects China's integration into the world together with those anti-globalization waves. Of course, that anti-globalization wave is not only because of China, it's because of a wide range of reasons, but all, all those things, you know, together will, you know, impact on China's integration into the world economy. So these are the challenges. That's why we see, you, you, you see, um, this is the producer pur uh, purchasing index, shows the confidence of the, the industry producers. We see now, uh, during the pandemic and also now, the producer uh, 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 purchase index 
even you know with inactive index growth um, in China. So these are real challenges, real challenges. Then whether China has really come to its peak. And um, so um, this is a question you know, oh, that we are, we, are, uh, we are asking. And uh, in addition to those questions in particular, I want to highlight the, 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 the uh, uh, geopolitical tension and the decoupling um, suggested by some politicians, although now there's some politicians then again saying uh, we should reject decoupling. So, however, my observation is that no matter politicians say the, there should be de decoupling or some politicians say, you know, we should reject decoupling. I think this decoupling now is taking place very slowly, although it's uneven, you know, in different areas, in different areas uneven, and it's not linear. So it's not a straightforward kind of uh, 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 um, decoupling. So why I say slowly uneven and non-linear? Uneven because it's in the economic area, the data still show deepening trade and investment linkages. So if we look at you know, China's trade relationship with the world and China's foreign direct investment, investment relationship with uh, the rest of the world, we see 2018 is the year Donald Trump come, become the president of the US and launched the trade war. And we see, and 2020 uh, and 2021, 2022, these are the years of the pandemic. Despite all of these China's exports to the world, we see still go, growing up. And also China-US trade, is, has been, we see kind of you know, registered increasing trade deficit by the US and increasing trade surplus, uh, um, you know, enjoyed by China. So they still import a lot from China. And look at foreign direct investment. Although many people say that a lot of multinationals are leaving China, they are, you know, they're relocating, et cetera. Looking at the data, still, China inward and outward FDI, even until 2021, still growing, still growing. Um, during the pandemic, China has been one of the safest place that international capital has been looking for. So there are still man, the kind of you know a, a foreign investment going to China, although there are uh, direct investment, also portfolio investment going to China. Um, you know. Regarding China as one of the safest uh, investment destination, so economically, although uh, politicians, some right wing politicians were, were were really pressing, you know, uh, on on a very hard line on China, um, the business sector actually, you know, especially from Europe, they are still going to China, still going to China. However. This, if we look at the, the, the global value chain, this relocation is really happening. We see some kind of multinationals relocate from China to its neighboring countries like Vietnam. Now Vietnam is the country with the highest GDP, one of the countries with the highest GDP you know, last year. And they also relocate to some other countries in Southeast Asia, et cetera. And in Europe, in North America, we see this reshoring, regionalization, or localization of the global value chain. And in North America, you know, one Canada, Mexico, and the US signed a new round of the, 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 the new version of the NAFTA, and their value chain are increasingly uh, regionalized, regionalized in the in, in North America. And if we talk to the, the, to the experts in international business, multinational studies, uh, and also you know, in the sector, in the industry, this relocation, regionalization, or at least diversification, 
they may not kind of remove their uh, uh, operations uh, subsidiaries from out of China, but they are setting up new subsidiaries elsewhere. So this is the diversification. So all this actually is happening. And although it's costly and it's slowly, but this is really happening and will continue, will continue. From business perspective, this is, you know, for them it's about their uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, risk control and the sustainability of the, the, the supply chain. So that's why I say it's slowly, but it's happening and uneven. And the, the most hard area of the decoupling is related to technology and the, and, the, uh, and the political relations, especially in the high technology area. Um, so um, not only in the US, but also in this country, we see um, that in some of the high tech areas, some areas could be, you know, have double use. What is double use? You could be used for civil or, 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 uh, purpose, but that technology could be also used for for, for military purpose, now the, the visas, the students' application and the visiting uh, uh, science um, um, people's exchange and the research and the innovation collaboration all being affected, be all being affected and the voices ha has uh, kept on to be there. So that's why I honestly, I think, you know, no matter what politicians say, now and then, they keep on changing. I think the decoupling is slowly happening in some of the area, despite the, 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 the current still going on increasing economic engagement. But behind this, I think this is a transition in period. After that, after the transition, this global value chains kind of diversification and the regionalization or even reshoring back to the industrialized countries will take place, will take place. So there are a lot of challenges. Does all those mean China, you know, will come, China's growth will come to its peak? And my answer is not, it, it, it is a no, is a no, uh, because there are other sides. The other side is about opportunities for China's economic growth, for China's economic growth. So one of the driver, there are several drivers. One of the driver is Chinese modernization. So last year, the Chinese, the Communist Party had its major conference. And uh, at that conference, the Chinese president Xi Jinping said, we should press ahead with our modernization to drive forward our national rejuvenation and contribute uh, more to humanity, more to hum humanity. So this Chinese modernization, according to Chinese government, is different from the modernization theory and the modernization we have seen so far in the literature and in, in human history. And uh, they have proposed five characteristics of Chinese modernization. I think to a certain extent, these five characteristics are true. The first is this is a modernization for a huge population. So there are industrialized countries, modernized countries, but no country has a population size as large or even close to China's size. The close ones, India still on its way still on its way. Secondly, this modernization aims at common prosperity for everyone, for everyone. So this is emphasized about do not leave no one, uh, you know, leave no one behind, leave no one behind, about uh, uh, common uh, prosperity and uh, equity. So this is an objective, of course, in previous modernization literature, this has not been kind of, you know, it's more about efficiency. However, this, you know, nowadays, inclusive development, inclusive society is the, the whole global, and there is a global consensus. United Nations 
um, sustainable development goal is the 2030 development goal. The main thing is about leave no one behind, leave no one behind. So thirdly, it's about balancing material and the cultural ethical progress. So it's about, you know, not materially get welfare and the rich, but also spiritually, culturally, you, you know, they'll get more confident and the rich. Uh, number four is about harmonious coexistence between uh, human humanity and the nature. So this is about uh, climate change, uh, sustainable development. Of course, this is a new uh, uh, concept if we look at the modernization literature and also trying to emphasize again, it, it will follow a path of peaceful development, of peaceful development. Um, so yeah, I think so far, China's rise so far in the past four decades, I think has followed a peaceful development. We haven't seen major uh, uh, conflict or, or yeah, uh, uh, war um, that uh, followed China's economic uh, 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 growth and expansion. So that's, this modernization is quite comprehensive, will help China to address some of the challenges about social discontent, about inequality, about climate change, about rebalancing. Yeah, so I think this will, you know, address some of the, the showing government's kind of commitment to address those kind of challenges. And also what, another one is creativity, innovation and the technology, knowledge-driven growth. So China actually, when I, I came to the UK and my PhD is about export foreign direct investment and the economic growth. I went to Cambridge in 20, uh, 2003. I work on a project is looking at innovation in comparing innovation in the UK and the US and the Europe. Even at that time, in the Chinese literature about growth development, very, very little research talking about innovation and technology. They only talk about technology transfer. Very little about talking about innovation. However, 2006, the country, the government kind of, you know, put innovation to the center of its development strategy, emphasized indigenous innovation. 2016, another 10 years later, innovation-driven development. So the development becomes innovation-driven development. It's not trade-driven. It's not investment-driven. It's not foreign direct investment-driven. It's innovation-driven development. So really has given a lot of emphasis to innovation and to build up its innovation and technology capability. China is still on its way, it's still on its way, but we can see China now is actually China's R&D expenditure now is number two in the world. China's R&D expenditure exceeds the R&D expenditure of all the European countries. China is only number two in the world follow Oh, uh, that uh, you know, follow the United States, and if China keep on this growth rate, China will China's R&D expansion will e exceed that of the United States in a few years. In a few years, so it is you know um, has made great efforts and investment into innovation, and then if we look at global innovation index, this is the WIPO. World Intellectual Property Organization's kind of global innovation index. China has risen from number 32 10 years ago to number 11 last year. So in 10 years, China ranking in the world has risen from 32 to number 11. You see, easier to, to rise from later, you know, from, from, from 100 to 50. But from the more close to the top, the more difficult to catch up. But in 10 years, it's really compressed kind of uh, catch up. China has risen from uh, number 32 to number 11 last year. That's its R&D expenditure. And the, in the green area, this is just one of the examples. China also make a lot of investment in other high-tech areas, including AI, including robots, etc. If we look at investment in renewable energy, now 
China is number one investor in renewable energy R&D in the world. It's since 2013. Since 2013, China is number one and continue to be number one in the world. And then we can see China's R&D expenditure in, in, uh, in renewable energy exceeds the blue ones, which is the European in total. And where is the US? That's the top left. And the US is kind of, you know, this level, zero to 60, this level, this scale. And the India is this scale, this scale. So China's investment in R&D, uh, um, in renewable energy, actually, you know, has been one of the leaders in the world. And uh, it's about 10 years, about 10 years. This is one of the area we see the result. We see the result. One of the example is in the electrical vehicle uh, uh, industry. China now accounts for 57 of global production of electrical uh, vehicle in the world in 2021. Well, automobile is not China's strength. You know, automobile is Germany, UK, France, United States, Japan, Korea's uh, main kind of area. But in electrical vehicle, China now accounts nearly 60% of world production. And then solar power, uh, uh, solar PV panel. Solar PV panel, China and India are the two largest producer in the world, accounts for more than 90% of world's production of solar PV panel. So China's kind of industrial production and the technological capabilities in the green area really has built up, really has built up. And uh, so that's why I, together with colleagues uh, from Denmark, from Italy, we added uh, a special issue um, that we found out actually, China's experience suggests there is a green window of opportunity for the developing countries. China and India showing there is green windows of, of opportunity to catch up for the developing countries. So artificial intelligence, China, again, number two in the world, following the United States, but overtaking other countries and also Europe, uh, um, uh, and also uh, Europe. Will China become a world innovation leader? This is a question. Many people are saying, you know, maybe China do a lot of imitation, but not really a major creator of groundbreaking innovation. This is a very important question. Whether China can become a really kind of groundbreaking innovation creator. Groundbreaking innovation comes from freestyle exploration or from problem solving, like global challenges. We don't have existing technology to solve global challenges. And then you, you solve that question, you can also have groundbreaking innovation. So in China, we have to admit this blue sky free exploration has limited space at current, uh, 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 in current situation. Now, they are very much emphasizing problem solving. Problem solving. So problem solving will, you know, if they go continue to do this problem solving, you may create groundbreaking innovation uh, from problem solving activities. And the innovation you can never plan, you can never predict. You may have some, you know, major kind of uh, paradigm shifting innovation from there. Maybe you will have, um, you know, a kind of technological capabilities spill over from problem solving to blue sky, to lead to blue sky uh, innovation. So um, the answer, I think it's not a definite no. Uh, I think there is potential, you know, to create some uh, um, groundbreaking innovation from China through this problem solving activity. And also the, the capabilities spill over, knowledge spill over from problem solving to other sectors, to other sectors. Now come, yeah, um, um, time for me to, go, to, to wrap up China's role in the world economy in 2030. There are challenges, there are opportunities. So, where will be China in 2030? What's the growth of China look like? 
No, it's very pessimistic. Economists say it's flatty. In, in, uh, in China, also some economists will say, well, we see slowdown, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, economic growth. And my argument, it will be kind of upward ace-shaped kind of growth uh, pathway. This is the early stage of early stage of uh, economic uh, 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 growth since the reforms, and now come to a, a kind of a, 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 a plat kind of you know a bottleneck uh, peer, uh, a stage, which you have to shift the engine and uh, need structural change, technological uh, uh, upgrading, and also change of the, the 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 growth pattern. So this will be a difficult time which I think China is at this kind of transition time, trans various transformation. If China can go through this uh, transformation, capturing the green windows of opportunity, digital windows of opportunity, and accumulate its innovation and technological capabilities after some time, this can never achieve over, over, overnight. This has to be accumulative and built over time. Then it will have another uh, uh, wave of uh, uh, higher growth, higher growth, although not as steep as the early uh, kind of uh, 30 or 40 years. Why I say so? Why I say so? Um, when I was born, I was born during the Cultural Revolution. So I have seen China come from a low income country to a lower middle to a higher middle income country. And also during my years in China, I have seen the resilience. Chinese economy. When people talk about the resilience of Chinese economy, normally talk about its huge size. It's in addition to its huge size, I think the, the people, very hardworking people, uh, the entrepreneurs, and also, you know, the current government, I think it has a strong uh, kind of willingness uh, to maintain its office in government. And therefore, it has some self-correction mechanism in the in the in the current party. If we look at look back, you know, uh, uh, 40, 50, 70 years, there are some self-correction of the government. So my time in China, we ha I have seen economic and political crisis in the past 40 years. So and also, I have seen inflation period, which is two digits in China. At that time, I go to the bank, the, the, the one year fixed kind of, you know, uh, deposit, the interest rate is 8%. I still remember 8% interest rate. So two digits, they are very bad time too. So political crisis, economic crisis, et cetera, and the, the, the country went through, went through. So now the current time is very difficult. But look, this in the history, in the long history, it's just a moment. It is a moment here, you see kind of ups and downs, ups and downs. So it's not linear, but once you went through, accumulate this technological innovation capability, and it has space to go up. Because even like in the US, the, 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 the government has a vote, vote in China, now it's a developed country, not a developing country, but we know there is a large part of China still developing country. Developing country means it has the, the space to grow. It has the space of a higher growth. Of those in the middle and the west part of China, even in the coastal part of China, there are also like in Guangdong, the, the, the north of Guangdong, the, 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 the west of Guangdong, still very poor, still very poor. So lifting those parts of China, we'll, we will see, you know, higher economic growth, higher economic growth, and uh, uh, and also technology and knowledge uh, uh, kind of driven economic growth. And this potential has not been released. China's growth currently is not really a much innovation driven or knowledge driven economy. And once innovation come to place, the country will grow. Um, so yeah. I think China will, will, will bounce back, will bounce back. Finally, about China in the world. Whether the world, you know, can decouple, decouple with China. Um, and uh, what will, would the world be if it really decouple with China? 
And actually, if we look at the global challenges from poverty to climate change, uh, and there are many global challenges, all this you know, cannot be effectively addressed without China. Terrorism, uh, climate change, poverty, and also other kind of resources, energy crisis, multiple crisis, energy crisis, uh, food crisis, uh, et cetera, we are we all experiencing. Without China, this crisis cannot be effectively addressed. addressed. And therefore, I very much agree with the foreign ministry of the United Kingdom. Uh, James Cleveland said, I think not far ago, he said it would be wrong to declare a new Cold War. Um, this would be a betrayal of our national interests and a willful misunderstanding of the modern world. I very much agree with him. And I remember he said we should reject the filthy deities trap theory. And I too, for a long time, I never believed in this because the times are different. People's understanding of the world is different. And our knowledge about each other are different. And the communications channels are, are much more than the Roman time, you, you, you see. Why we still think the Roman time or other time or the one the British rise or the Portuguese rise, there are wars. So that China's rise, there must be a war. Um, I think we should think more creatively rather than, you know, still think 2000 years ago, there, there is a war when there is a power uh, a transition. So that now there will be a war between China uh, and the United States and the Arab countries should take sides. Uh, I, I honestly, um, I respect the, 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 the scholar who, you know, study international relations and, uh, and developed uh, various uh, uh, great theories, but I reject this this attack theory. I think it's too static, too static. Uh, so what the world should be, uh, we, I have done, I published a paper in JIBT, General of International Business Policy, together with JC Lee, Ari, Vash, et cetera, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, on Belt Road and, the, 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 and this kind of built back better world, this is the, the Western Bloc kind of Belt and the Road Initiative. And inspired by, by that, I think the relationship between the, uh, the worlds should be a workable relationship between US and China. I, I be honest, I don't think US and China will come to a kind of animal relationship. Yeah. And uh, um, so maintain a workable relationship and find some common fields, small common fields, uh, kind of anti terrorist uh, climate change. But it's a collaborative, wide collaborative relationship with the rest of the world between China and the rest, and between US and the rest of the world. And therefore, the rest of the world will have a lot of overlap, collaboration with these two countries. And the rest of the world, of the world can be important bridge and a stabilizer of the world. Um, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you.